Einstein's special theory has two basic postulates. Number one, is that C is constant, same for all inertial observers. Number two is that laws of physics are covariant, that they have the same form in all frames. For example, in one frame, if we have F is equal to dp by dt. In the other frame, we might have something like this, where time is different, momentum is different, maybe force is different, but the form of the law is the same for all observers. So that's what I mean by the laws to be covariant. And we saw that the first postulate has certain consequences. And number one was that two events that happen at the same time in one frame may not happen at the same time in another frame. It's relative simultaneity. And the second consequence was time dilation. that delta t is gamma delta t naught, where we uh, did also some problems in the situations to differentiate between the proper time and improper time. Proper time is the time between two events. Excuse me. Why are you going all again and again towards that person? That's a good point. So maybe if you can uh, now pick up the bag, then people can move this way. OK, so the proper time interval is the time interval between two events that happen at the same time in one frame. For example, if I do one, and then again, in this room, it, with respect to all of you, both events happen at the same time. So the time interval is proper. It doesn't ma matter if this room is flying with a speed v is equal to 0.999c, right? But for another observer, which may be standing outside and probably peeking through uh, a window, this first happened here. And since the room is flying, the second might happen here. So the time interval for him is not proper. The third consequence that we saw is that length contracts and the relation is this. And uh, let me say a few words about so this proper length and improper length again. So proper length is the length of something which is at rest with respect to the measure or the observer. For example, this remote for me has a proper length. Doesn't matter how I measure it. If I measure it using some scale or if I shoot light pulse from here and let it go and reflect from a mirror maybe somewhere here and come back and I uh, find the length by uh, dividing the speed of light with the time interval, it's independent of the uh, measurement strategy. And it's actually independent of the presence of this remote itself. It's a proper length, which is the interval from uh, uh, between this and this point. And both points are stationary with respect to the measure. If, let's say again, this room is flying, and somebody is also trying to measure the length of this remote, for him, this point and this point, they're both moving like this. Whatever way he uses to measure this length, this length would be called improper for him. and. Uh, uh, we, we saw one of the way of doing it in the last lecture, uh, and the length comes out to be smaller than its proper length. And actually, again, it's not just uh, the presence of this thing, but uh, uh, even if this remote is not present, the length interval between these two points would seem to be contracted to any observer who is moving with respect to these two points. 
and that lens is contracting. I hope it uh, clears up the uh, one person's confusion regarding the proper lens. So at the end, if you remember, we were discussing something which is called twins paradox, even though I didn't use the word that day. So the problem was something like this, that you have this point, let me call it Earth, and then this star, it's actually the nearest star uh, to the Sun, Proxima Centauri, and there's a certain distance. I'm not, I'm not even interested in the numbers. So there's some length D, and let me, or maybe length M not, and this is proper because we have measured it uh, in uh, some form of uh, uh, rest frame where they serve, and these are almost stationary. So if there's a spaceship, <laughs> which is going in this direction with certain speed v, the question was, how long will it take to go from here to here? The answer, if you think in terms of classical mechanics, you would say, OK, let me divide L0 with v, and the time that I will get is the time that this ship should take. But when you are traveling in this ship, for you, this distance is not L0. So for a person inside the ship, the distance is L naught by gamma. So the time for a person inside the ship is divided by So this is the time for somebody inside the ship. For a person who is observing this thing from Earth, for him, the time is so this is length L naught. The speed is v. So this is the time. So I'll come to that. So for this person, this is proper time because he had a clock in his ship. He turned it on, and he's going. And when he reached Proxima Centauri, he turned it off. So the time is proper. And the time interval for an observer on Earth is improper. And you can see they also nicely relate with that formula of time dilation. Because if you multiply, uh, if you, uh, this is the, uh, this is the proper time. If you multiply this with gamma, you get the improper time. <laughs> so everything is insane. The trouble was coming when we were discussing this thing. That Let's say for an observer on Earth, it takes one year to go from here to here. But for a person inside the ship, it only takes one month for the sake of argument. So when this person goes this way and then comes back, he would think that only uh, one month has passed, uh, and two months, yes. One this way, one this way. But the person on Earth would say, no, two years has passed, and then from the, let's say that this is the case, which is almost uh, going to be the case. But then there was trouble that how does this thing relate to relate with this formula? Earth, gamma, whatever this thing is. So we saw that the ship started from here. It went and came back at the same point. So in Earth's frame, the two events are happening at the same time. In spaceships of frame, the two events are happening at the same time at the same point. So it means they both have proper time. So how to uh, relate their time to this kind of formula? The answer lies in this uh, fallacy that we have uh, ignored, which is that there are these two different inertial frames, which we are mixing them together. So there's one inertial frame which was attached to a ship when it was moving this way with constant speed v at a certain point. That frame is again moving with constant speed and going far away uh, in the same direction. But the ship is now not an inertial frame any longer. It's decelerating, decelerating, stopping, and then accelerating, accelerating. And then he's, let's say, attaching itself to another inertial frame, which is coming in this direction with speed v. 
So this is a separate inertial frame, this is a separate inertial frame. What you can do, you can relate this time interval of one month with this one year time, and for Earth it is improper because it goes from here to here. For ship it's proper and it relates properly to the sequence. So that paradox is resolved if you uh, take into account this fact that there are these two different frames that, that are here. And by the way, that is the reality that if somebody travels with this such a high speed and goes away and comes back, he would have aged much slower than somebody on Earth. That's what the theory of relativity is telling us. Uh, it has been done and it's been continuously done. You have uh, put uh, your atomic clocks on uh, global positioning systems. The satellites are oscillating and the clocks appear to be slower to us. That's why we have that correction work down into it. Yes? Why? Because it has to be like this where the proper time is smaller and improper time is larger. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same. So for him, yes, if there is an event, so this is the question is that in reverse it should be true. If somebody is going here, he should think that the, the smaller time here is appearing a larger. That's correct. If there are, there are two other events that are happening on Earth, let's say this one and this one, that interval would appear to be larger to him. And that's going to be the case. But it's not happening here because there is proper time and improper time. OK, so I'm sorry I can't take that many questions. Uh, I'll be staying here after the class if you have uh, more questions. And we have recitations, and my office is always open. So let me just continue with the the, with the consequences, so today I am actually going to discuss another consequence, consequence number four, which is Doppler effect. You have already studied this for some ways, many of you, and we will see that how it is different and uh, how it is same and what are its usefulness. In, in physics. But before I do that, I am briefly going to review electromagnetic waves. Electromagnetic waves are the oscillations of electric and magnetic fields. And light is an electromagnetic wave uh, in many situations. That's how it behaves. So let's study the electromagnetic wave in general briefly. And once we develop some conception of waves, I have come back to this Doppler effect. So a wave is something that has a pattern of, of some quantity. Let's say uh, there's an electric field which is like this. And when I say like this, it means it has a stronger magnitude here, smaller magnitude here, smaller magnitude. Then maybe negative direction, but magnitude increasing then maximum, then magnitude decreasing, and directional is reversal. So there is uh, an electric field set up which has oscillating electric field as we move this way. But not only that, a wave, a traveling wave, has this property that this pattern moves in time. So there is a periodic variation in space. If there is an electromagnetic wave passing through here, and there are millions of them are passing right now. Uh, because this light that is coming out, the, our mobile phones, and a lot of other devices, this uh, headset is uh, connected by electromagnetic waves to a receiver there, which is uh, connected with this through this plane. So if you take a picture in time of this situation, you will see uh, an electric field variation, which is periodic. That there's a certain magnitude of electric field which is increasing, then decreasing, and then in the negative direction because it's a vector quantity, it's decreasing, it's increasing, and then decreasing, and then increasing, and so on. But not only that, if you take a snapshot in, snapshot in time, 
You stand here, and at just one point, you keep observing the intensity of electric field. The intensity of electric field at this point in time, as the time passes, would be increasing, increasing, and then uh, after a maximum, it's coming down, coming down, and then decreasing in the other direction, and, and so it goes. So it oscillates both in space and in time. This is the property of wave. Actually, this is the property of sound wave as well. I'm talking the, the, the sound waves that are coming from speakers are coming to you. So it's essentially a pressure distribution in air molecules. So the air is oscillating like this. But if you take a snapshot in space, you will see a density higher here and lower here, density higher here, lower here. So a product pattern is repeating. But not only that, if you stand at one point and with time you uh, measure its intensity of, of pressure, the pressure intensity would be oscillating periodically, increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, and this way. So that's why we often represent waves with this formula. So electric field I can represent as some constant magnitude, some number into x, some number into two. So if you're not uh, that familiar with cosine, you don't have to worry about it. Let me just represent it using certain plot. So if at a given time, let's say at some given time, you picture this quantity and plot its magnitude, it's going to be something like this. So it's a periodic pattern in X. But not only that, if you stand at one position, you fix your position, and you measure the same quantity as a function of time, you will see a periodic pattern again. So it's periodic in time, periodic in space, and that's why to characterize these waves, we can uh, uh, we have certain you know numbers that we can ascribe to differentiate different types of waves, and the two three basic things is this what we call wavelength and represented by Greek letter lambda and then so this is a distance after which the wave repeats itself in space and similarly we can assign a quantity in time which we call time period capital T so this is a time after which the wave repeats itself at a given point so this is repetition at a given time in space. This is repetition in time at a given point in space. And we can, uh, from this, we can actually find an expression for the speed. So speed should be lambda by t. Why? If you look at this thing, and let's say you consider at this point. So this wave is moving this way. So it goes from here, 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 here at this point, and that's what it repeat. So this is a wave. This this distance is called lambda. But how long did it take from to go from here to here? Time capital T, which is period. So if I divide the distance by the period, I get the speed. And you can actually represent speed in another way as well. So since we can define a frequency f, which is 1 over the time period. It's actually the number of oscillations in one second. So if, if I use this, I can write speed as c is equal to f lambda. So you see, it comes from this thing, this simple relation. This lambda is the distance after which is repeat periodic, repeat. And since in the time, so this is the wave. जितनी देर में ये जो क्रस्ट है वो यहाँ से यहाँ पहुँचा है इसने एक वेवलेस डिस्टेंस ट्रेवल किया है उतनी देर में इस टाइम पे वेव ने दोबारा रिपीट कर लिया सो जो टाइम पीरियड है उतनी देर में वेव एक वेवलेस ट्रेवल कर दिया है सो दैट्स व्हाई द स्पीड इज डिस्टेंस ओवर टाइम लैम्डा ओवर � so we are talking only in one frame now. Let's say in this room frame, a wave is passing through here. Okay, so uh, this is the basic thing where we represent different waves. Now, electromagnetic waves, 
are a huge, are, 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 are same in, in one sense, but they are quite different in another sense. And the difference only comes from this thing. So you can see that we can have a wave whose wavelength is, uh, let's say, one meter, or maybe two meter, or one centimeter, or 0.1 meter, and so on. And by the way, electromagnetic waves are produced usually by oscillating charges. For example, if you have an antenna, let's say an antenna like this, and you put some oscillator here. So this is the antenna. So this is an oscillating voltage. So positive wire, negative wire, but since it's oscillating, so this is becoming positive, this is negative. So essentially, the negative phosphor charge is oscillating like this. Negative is going up like this, this is positive, and then positive going down, so the charge is oscillating like this. So since a positive charge will have an electric field here, and a negative charge would have an electric field, and the charge is oscillating, the electric field is uh, oscillating as well. And that oscillating electric field is producing waves like this. And if this has a period, let's say, one millisecond, the period of the wave would be one millisecond. And from the period, since speed of electromagnetic wave is fixed, the wavelength can always be computed from here. So lambda is C into P. So lambda is C, P. So a time period can give us the wavelength because C is same for all electromagnetic waves. <coughs> But, and, and, and if you want to get different wavelength, you have to get different frequencies, a time period, and you get different types of waves. But with this thing, there's a huge variety of wave, electromagnetic waves that are available. If you uh, go 100 years back, one of the most commonly used electromagnetic waves were radio waves. People have big radios, and there are big antennas that were transmitting uh, electromagnetic waves, because usually, the antenna you need has to have a size which has uh, the same length, roughly speaking, as wavelength. <coughs> and since uh, radio waves, they have a frequency of uh, uh, about 1 megahertz. So if frequency is 1 megahertz, which is 10 power 6 hertz, the wavelength should be, so here <coughs> you lambda should be, 3 into 10 power 8 C and time period is 1 over F divided by 10 power 6. This is about 300 meters. So your antenna should be about uh, a few hundred meters. Have you seen such a big antenna? This TV has a, a bigger frequency, so hence wavelength is smaller. You have seen people who have been in the GT Road from Islamabad. Raise your hand. If you have seen so many people, you haven't seen that those big antennas near Rabat. And if you are going from here to Islamabad on the right side, it's several, it's more than 1,000 acres. You see those big antennas? When they were built in 1960s, they were actually one of the most powerful transmitter antennas sending radio signals to Africa and North and South America as well, on the other side of the world. But, and you see that why we needed those big antennas, because the antennas really have to have the same dimension as wavelength. And of course, when you go to higher frequency, for example, microwave that your mobile phones uses, it, is, it has about one gigahertz frequency, so for about 8 gigahertz or 12 gigahertz. If you have a giga, laga, 10 power 9, so you have another point three meters, which is one feet. So mobile base station which has, which are more powerful, they have these tube light type things that you see, they are these antennas. But your mobile phone, they have less efficient but smaller antennas. So similarly, we, we can get other types of waves. Microwaves, they have smaller wavelengths. These then uh, infrared waves, which have uh, uh, another smaller wavelength. And then we have, uh, let me just draw this pattern. So 10 power 2, this is the wavelength. So we have radio, 10 power and about 1, uh, maybe 0 0.1 meter. This is in meters. We have microwave, 
and if you keep going millimeter wave and then you can come to infrared waves which are which have really one micrometer wavelength these are infrared and when you keep on increasing and go 0.7 to 0.4 micrometer these are the electromagnetic waves that our eyes can see, right? These are which we call light. And guess what? The, the length of rods and cones in our eyes, it has a dimension of about 0 0.5, 0 0.6 micrometers. That's why we can see light in this way. If you keep on decreasing wavelength, let's say you go to uh, one nanometer, these are called X-rays. And if you go even above, so there is, so th there are colors. For example, it's going about the look nanometers, maybe 700 nanometer, 400 nanometer. So this color is violet. This color is red, uh, indigo, blue, etc. And these are called ultraviolet X-rays, and then you go to smaller wavelength, let's say 1 angstrom or 0.1 angstrom, you have what we call gamma rays, which comes out of PPS. This wavelength. So antenna should have approximately the same length, but it can be different. They, it comes out from actually physics when you design an antenna, they have resonances close to the, that, that length, so they radiate more efficiently. Lambda? Thanks, Ron. Okay? So you see there's a huge variety of electromagnetic waves that uh, can be there. And what I'm going to discuss today in, in the class, which is Doppler effect, it's valid for all of this. And now you can actually see, we can uh, slightly rephrase special theory of relativity. Instead of saying that speed of light should be same, because light usually refers to this visible part in most people's mind. So we can give a better statement that electromagnetic waves have the same speed in all frames for all inertial observers. Okay, so let's now begin a Doppler, uh, the, the Doppler effect. And uh, you'll see that this is much more interesting than Doppler effect for sound waves. And let's consider a source here, which is, let me call it a frame XY, which is emitting electromagnetic waves like this. And suppose here you are an observer, and you are trying to measure the wavelength of the light emitted by this source. And for this uh, case, let me assume that this is stationary and this observer is moving towards the source with speed v. So what this is doing, this is emitting a wave like this. So it has a certain time period if this plot is against time and it has a certain Wavelength. So, if it's stationary, what will happen? Let's say observer is also stationary. If it's stationary, then the wave is coming like this. So, here I have a detector. So, I want to record the wavelength on that. So, I'm here. So, when this crest pass, I turn on my stopwatch. And I wait for the second crest to pass. So, when the second crest pass, so I will do that I will turn off my stop and I will know that it is C. No, speed is constant for all. So what I will do, I will find my wavelength as C P prime. So the wavelength is emit P, it is C P. So he emitted a light 
with type in your T and variance lambda. So what I found is a variance lambda prime by measuring the time that it took for it to uh, oscillate once. And since this is stationary and that is stationary, so T prime will be equal to T. So we will get lambda prime is equal to lambda. But again, first I am moving. So this observer is sweeping from here to here and also trying to measure this wavelength. And the way is that when this crest passed, I turned on a stopwatch and I am waiting for the second crest to pass. When the second crest came, I turned off the stopwatch. I computed time T prime. So uh, I simply uh, am trying to find the wavelength. So ye lambda prime to see T prime so multiply karunga. But we can see that we have to add another part because we are moving with speed V. So itne time mein hum kitna distance travel kar chuke honge that we have to subtract from it. So the wavelength that I will measure will be this. अब यू वेव है यहाँ से जब वेव अगर तो खड़े रहते हैं तो इट कम्स एंड आफ्टर टाइम ई प्राइम इट रिपीट्स इटसेल्फ वी मल्टीप्लाई बट इफ यू आर आल्सो वॉकिंग सो इट मींस दैट डिस्टेंस हैव टू बी सब्ट्रैक्टेड फ्रॉम दिस वन टू फाइंड द वेव और इसमें देखे दो दोनों फैक्टर आ रहे एक है दिस हैज टू बी सी टी प्राइम द सेकेंड पार्ट इज दैट दिस पार्ट विच आई मूव while the wave was coming, I have to subtract it to actually measure it to right. Okay, because if I move it with the same way, then I will get to the crust first. If we don't subtract it, we will get a wrong measurement. So to get the correct measurement, I multiply this and then subtract my moving part. No, because I have moved this part. So let's see again. So this is that uh, this is the time t prime that it oscillates once. So it means that this is the distance traveled by the wave, and this is the v t prime is the distance traveled by v. So essentially, for me, this is the wavelength. Ha, so mere to wavelength ye hui na. Okay, wavelength kya hai? Kitne distance ke baad repeat kar? So this is the distance that I will get if I'm stationary, and if I'm moving, I, this part will be subtracted automatically. This has to be subtracted because you see, for me, this is the wavelength, not this. So ये कैसे मिलेगा? This minus this. So this is the wavelength of this. Put a little bit of this. So you get lambda prime c minus v e prime. But now there is another catch, and that's where it is different from sound wave. Catch ये है कि ये जो time period है e prime. This is not equal to p, but this is equal to gamma t. So the time dilation and contraction, they are the two factors of the same thing. So this is the time that I will measure as the time period of the wave. So the T prime ki jaga pe we will put gamma T. So we get C minus V gamma T. T prime is not proper time because it's measured by a moving observer. So when I'm moving, so they can be me has a those the points and I'm trying to measure while I'm moving. So why why it's proper time for me? This case we know because there's this relative thing. So there's a frame here and the frame here. So there's this relative velocity. So in in relative it doesn't matter. It's the relative speed which matters. Okay, so यहाँ से capital T is the time emitted, time in the rest frame. Okay, 
तो फर्क करें आप स्टेशनरी है तो उस वक्त जो टाइम पीरियड है दो टेस्ट के दरमियान में दैट इज दी दैट इज दी प्रॉपर टाइम वेन यू आर मूविंग द टाइम इज इम प्रॉपर एंड इट इज गिवन बाय दिस ठीक है आप पहले आप इस तरह करेंगे यहां पे हैं आप स्टेशनरी होके यू लेट वन प्लस पास एंड देन वेट फॉर द सेकंड प्लस एंड द सेकंड प्लस पास इज हियर यू मेजर द टाइम सो दैट इज द प्रॉपर टाइम नो यू ट्राई टू डू दैट वाइल यू आर मूविंग सो लेट मी कंप्लीट दिस देन आई टेक सम क्वेश्चन सो लेमडा प्राइम इज सी माइनस वी एंड गामा इज नथिंग बट वन माइनस वी स्क्वेयर सी स्क्वेयर and uh, we have this t and t is uh, so c minus v 1 minus v square c square t is lambda over c so the c goes here so 1 minus v over c isko aap a square minus b square formula se likh sakte hain 1 minus 1 plus और इसको आप लिख सकते हैं ऊपर वाले को इसका स्क्वायर कर लें स्क्वायर वो डाल दें तो ये बंदे ये ए इससे कैंसिल हो गया अभी है वन माइनस बी ओवर सी वन प्लस बी ओवर सी एंड दिस इज लैमडा प्राइम एंड मी राइट इट इन बिगर पॉइंट के so it means when you are moving towards the source there the relative velocity the wavelength that you will measure would be smaller than the wavelength that is emitted kyunki ye 1 minus jo hai ye this number would be smaller than 1 this number would be greater than 1 so you will get a wavelength which is smaller than this wave इस तरह की सिचुएशन को कहते हैं ब्लू शिफ्ट और ब्लू शिफ्ट इसलिए कहते हैं कि अगर आप ये स्पेक्ट्रम देखें सो देर इज अ ब्लू कलर हेयर विच इज टूवर्ड्स स्मॉलर वेवलन वेन यू गो टूवर्ड्स दिस थिंग दैट योर वेवलेंथ गेट स्मॉलर यू मूव टूवर्ड्स ब्लू और असल में ये जरूरी नहीं है कि आपका कलर ब्लू हो जाए हो सकता है क्या आप ये माइक्रोवेव में मेजर करें जैसे जो पुलिस वाले रडार हैं वो सब माइक्रोवेव में होते हैं एंड दे आल्सो आर मेजरिंग ब्लू और रेड शिफ्ट सो ब्लू शिफ्ट इज व्हेन वेवलेंथ रिड्यूसेस एंड रेड शिफ्ट इज व्हेन वेवलेंथ इंक्रीजेस इट डजंट मैटर नाम सिर्फ इसीलिए है कि ब्लू स्मॉलर वेवलेंथ की तरफ से रेड ग्रेटर वेवलेंथ की तरफ है लेकिन एक्चुअल सिचुएशन में कलर होना जरूरी नहीं है और यहां से यह भी देख लें इफ the observer is moving away from the source your lambda prime would be lambda 1 plus v over c 1 minus v over c this is called red shift so red shift is you when the wavelength increases when two things are getting apart so kya hoga yahan pe अगर ये इधर को जा रहा है देर वी प्लस साइन के सो उस प्लस की वजह से देर वी प्लस हेयर प्लस हेयर प्लस हेयर एंड देन दिस प्लस वन विल बी कैंसल एंड माइनस वुड बी लेफ्ट बिलो एंड अ प्लस वुड बी लेफ्ट अप सो वेन टू थिंग्स आर मूविंग अपार्ट द वेवलन गेट्स बिगर इट्स कॉल रेड सिक्स सिंपली बिकॉज रेड कम्स ऑन लॉर्जर वेव और जो चीजें अगर करीब आ रही हैं देन इट गेट्स ब्लू शिफ्ट तो जो साउंड वेव है उससे अगर आप डिफरेंस देखना चाहें तो वो दो तीन रिस्पेक्ट में है एक तो ये कि साउंड वेव में देर द डिफरेंस इन टू सिचुएशन के इफ द सोर्स इज स्टेशनरी एंड ऑब्जर्वर इज मूविंग टूवर्ड्स है या ऑब्जर्वर स्टेशनरी है एंड सोर्स इज मूविंग टूवर्ड्स है एंड दिस स्पेशली बिकम्स इंपॉर्टेंट इन द रिसीडिंग केस क्योंकि अगर यहाँ पे ऑब्जर्वर है और यहाँ पे सोर्स है और अगर सोर्स जो है वो अवे मूव कर रहा है सो इट इज पॉसिबल के दिस वेव साउंड वेव डजन रीच ऑब्जर्वर क्योंकि अब सोर्स कैन हैव अ स्पीड ग्रेटर देन स्पीड ऑफ साउंड राइट सो अगर स्पीड ऑफ साउंड से ग्रेटर है इट माइट नेवर रीच एंड सिमिलरली अगर ये ऑब्जर्वर सॉरी ऑब्जर्वर जब इधर को जा रहा है अगर इसकी अपनी स्पीड साउंड ऑफ स्पीड से ज्यादा है तो 
the, sphere, the song will never catch it. But that thing doesn't happen here. First of all, we, only, we are only concerned with relative speed. And the second, the speeds are always smaller than uh, speed of light. And plus, speed of light are the same uh, for all observers and, and sources. So my question is, redshift is that the wavelength is getting bigger. Because there's a plus sign here, minus sign. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's possible relative speed might matter. When you are getting closer, and it doesn't matter that this stationary hai or ye move kar raha hai ya ye stationary hai or ye move kar raha hai. When you are getting closer, the wavelength decreases. And when you are getting apart, the wavelength increases. And it's called that shift. Waha pe end pe ek sawal thak si ke? Di? Then agar, di raab ne bataya ke ye true time hai. ये टू टाइम किस चीज़ के रिस्पेक्ट में है? मैं टू टाइम तो बोल नहीं हूँ, वैसे प्रॉपर टाइम हम कह रहे हैं। तो प्रॉपर टाइम इस टाइम विच यू मेज़र इन रेस्ट फ्रेम। तो लेट मी गेट पैक हियर अगेन। ये देखिए, फर्स्ट करें अब्जर्वर स्टेशनरी है। इट अमिटेड सम लाइट। तो ये यहाँ पे आ I computed the time period. So this is proper time in my frame because I am doing both things here. Now when I am moving and I have to measure the wavelength and I have to measure the time period, I am trying to measure the time period. But now because I am moving, of course the time is not going to be proper. And whatever that time is, it can be computed from the proper time with this relation. So whenever a moving observer tries to measure some time interval, between those events which uh, uh, were proper in, in the rest frame, the time is not proper. Now, I want to test this here. It is that here the wavelength is coming from two terms. One is this part, which is uh, CT prime, and then there is a second part. And when we have combined them, we get this expression, C minus V into T prime. Now the wavelength will decrease as it's coming from two parts. One is from the C minus V part. Because V is smaller than C, so this is a number smaller than C, you get a wavelength smaller than lambda. But that's not the only contributing factor. The other thing is this gamma. So, so there are two things that are contributing to the wavelength uh, change. One is the relative speed. The other is time dilation. Or Actually, surprisingly, I think where the difference is the biggest from sound waves, if your observer is here and your source is moving in such a way that it's neither coming towards you nor moving away from you, even then the wavelength is different and seeps here. But not in the sound wave case, but here, because let's see there is a wave coming from here and the, so, the source is moving like this with some speed v. So the wave here will So I'm trying to measure its wavelength. I'm not moving So the wavelength measured by me would simply be this. That I measure the time period and then I multiply with c so I get my wavelength. But the time interval, this time interval, is now dilated with respect to this time interval by this factor gamma t which is 1 minus v square c square lambda prime and this is uh, this t is lambda over c so this cancels so we have lambda prime is equal to lambda minus 1 minus v square c square and you see Lambda in this case is always greater than lambda. Ye besha source idhar ko ja raha hai ya idhar ko ja raha hai. And this is red shift. Kyunki wavelength zyada hai. So iska matlab hai ke jab ek star se aapko light aa rahi hai and you are trying to measure its 
speak ki hamari taraf aa raha hai humse dur ja raha hai there is one thing that might confuse our observation because maybe the star is receding away from us to uski wajah se bhi red shift ho sakti hai aur ye bhi ho sakta hai ki star na humse dur ja raha na hamari taraf aa raha balki wo yu move kar raha hai in that case we will still get red shift so when you get a red shift red shifted signal from a star you cannot immediately say it's moving away from us you first have to look at the star for maybe several years or several thousand years sometime because for some of the stars we have a data spanning several thousand years so if the star changes its position in sky and you get red shift it means the red shift that you are getting is potentially from the the lateral shift and are receding as part as well so sometimes the astronomers have uh, harder part uh, uh, it, it's harder for them to distinguish the two things ha red shift are time dilation ki wajah se ye dekhiye यहां पे टाइम पीरियड है दो ऑसिलेशन के दरमियान में टाइम है अब उसी वेव को जब आप यहां से मेजर कर रहे हैं सो यू हैव टू फाइंड द टाइम पीरियड तो टाइम पीरियड जो है अब हमारे लिए जो भी टाइम पीरियड होगा दिस हैज टू बी डायलेटेड बिकॉज दिस इज अ स्टॉक व्हिच इज मूविंग विद स्पीड वी इसलिए के दिस इज इन वन फ्रेम this is the signal emitted in its rest frame okay so the light is emitted by a source in its rest frame so rest frame mein kaise ho raha hai ek jagah wahan se ek signal nikla let's say crust nikla fir thodi der baad dusra crust nikla to ek hi point pe uspe dono ho rahe so it's proper interval for the source but in proper interval for us because we are measuring a time interval on a moving source so I'm sorry. I'll uh, take more questions later. So I want to spread out the questions as well. Yes, you had a question. How you solve the left and right? How did I solve this? This one. So let me become. So you're okay until this point. So here, we see. Here, C. Here, this one is equal to one. Here, this one is equal to V by C. So I have put square and put square root. तो ये जो वन माइनस बी स्क्र और सी स्क्र है ये आपने फेमस फार्मूला पढ़ा होगा सो हाउ डे कन्वर्ट टू दिस सो दे सी हेयर So c minus v over c is so this c comes under it. This becomes one. This c comes under it. This becomes v over. Okay. So let me now do one example where we will compute the red shift. And actually, uh, this is an important example because this is one of those examples which revolutionizes. our understanding of the universe so example is and you will also see in this example how do we know that certain stars or certain things in sky they are moving and how do we know that they are moving with what speed so i have an example of a galaxy it's called hydra look at it It's called Hydra because of its uh, certain uh, tentacles type structure. So this is some galaxy. So this galaxy has a calcium cloud around it. And you see, this galaxy is about 200 million away from us. And how do we know it has a calcium cloud? And I'll tell you why. How do we know? So it has a calcium cloud around it. and if we look on the spectrum of calcium in our lab that i turn on a uh, in the lab so let's do it in lab on earth if we have this uh, flame and i put some calcium on it so there is this calcium cloud so if there is a calcium cloud from here the light which is traveling from here 
is absorbed by the atoms of calcium and electrons jump. And because of that, the spectrum that we see here, let's say I see a light here and I resolve it as a, a function of wavelength, I see that some lines are missing. Like this. So, and these lines have a characteristic pattern. Unki location bhi, aur unka distance bhi, aur phir yaha se yaha tak, yaha se yaha tak. It's a group of several lines. Maybe 15, 20, 30 lines. And it's almost like a barcode of an atom. Agar calcium ki jaga, sodium rakhe, it, has, it will have another absorption spectrum. So, from this characteristic spectrum, we can identify the elements present in this one. So, <coughs> using the same bike, so what we do when we get uh, light from a certain star, we take its spectrum and we have a library of spectrum of all the elements. We simply compare those barcodes with all of them by a computer. You people used to do by hand, but now by computer. And when it uh, matches a certain spectrum, we see that this is the element that it present. But actually, it's more than that. Lab ke andar jo calcium ka spectrum hai, ye sari lines jo maine yaha pe exaggerate ki hai, they come around 394 nanometer wavelength. <laughs> so, ye 394.9 pe hai, ye 394 pe hai, ye 394.2 pe hai, ye 394.25 nanometer pe hai. Oh, small difference. But they all come around this. Now, when we look at the light from here, so the light appears to have exactly the same pattern. This pattern is the same, but all of this group is shifted to 475 nanometers. So this is our lambda prime, and this is our lambda. So this is the wavelength emitted in rest frames. So the, the, this is the wavelength that we see uh, missing uh, from this uh, light that is coming from this galaxy, which is 200 million light away away. But we know that it's calcium because the spectrum matches the calcium pattern. Location change hai. So uh, we are pretty sure that this is a calcium, these are calcium lines. So using this information, let's try to compute कि ये जो हाइड्रो गैलेक्सी है ये कितनी स्पीड से हमसे दूर जा रही है एक को आप देख सकते हैं कि लैम्डा प्राइम लैम्डा से बड़ा है रेड शिफ्ट है तो और ये लाइट एक साल रेड शिफ्ट नहीं है ये लाइट क्योंकि बन ग्रीन कलर की है बट वी स्टिल कॉल इट बल्कि ब्लू कलर की है बट वी स्टिल कॉल इट रेड शिफ्ट बिकॉज द वेवलेंथ हैज इंक्रीज तो इस रेड शिफ्ट से लेट्स ट्राई टू मेजर द स्पीड ऑफ दिस गैलेक्सी विद रिस्पेक्ट टू अर्थ तो हाउ डू वी डू दैट it's uh, simple. I have this redshift formula. So all I have to do is solve it for V by C. So we have lambda prime, lambda 1 plus V by C, 1 minus V by C. Let me take squares on both sides. So I get lambda square, lambda square. 1 plus V by C, 1 minus V by C. So let's multiply the denominator here. 1 minus V by C, lambda square, 1 plus V by C, lambda prime square, lambda prime square V by C, lambda square plus lambda square v by c. So let's bring, uh, let's take this thing there and this here. So we get lambda prime square, this lambda here. So this is lambda square v by c. This goes on the other side. So it's lambda prime square v by c. So you have say v by c commonly. Lambda square, lambda square by lambda square plus lambda prime square v by c. So here again, my first. ठीक है यहाँ से मैंने v by c common लिया तो lambda square plus lambda prime square जो है वो यहाँ पे लिया है. अब आप simply lambda prime की value यहाँ put करें. 
लैम्डा यहाँ पुट करें ये भी लैम्डा लैम्डा पाइ पुट करें यू डू दी कैलकुलेशन यू गेट अ नंबर व्हिच इज जीरो पॉइंट वन एट फाइव सी वी बाय सी इज जीरो पॉइंट वन एट फाइव सी और वी इज इक्वल टू जीरो पॉइंट वन एट फाइव सी दिस अ ह्यूज स्पीड ह्यूज इट्स अबाउट ट्वेंटी परसेंट ऑफ स्पीड ऑफ लाइट so this is the speed by which this galaxy is receding from us yes please good question so maine usko bataya hai ke astronomer ke liye dil ka hota hai then look at a star for a very long time and they try to see if the star is shifting in sky or not if it is not shifting it means it mostly has uh, a longitudinal motion and not lateral motion yes नहीं एनर्जी लॉस इज समथिंग एल्स तो इनका सवाल है कि जरूरी है कि जो रेड शिफ्ट है वो मोशन की वजह से हो एनर्जी लॉस हो तरह से भी हो सकता है द रेड शिफ्ट इज नॉट एनर्जी लॉस नहीं इट्स एनर्जी लॉस एक एक उस सेंस में है इफ इफ यू गो टू इज गुड टू एक्सेप्ट बट इट्स एक्चुअली इंटेंस जो दूसरी वजह से जो है वो इंटेंसिटी लॉस हो Actually, you have a point, and I'll come to that. So there is other reasons for red shift too. So he has brought up this very interesting point. Maybe there's another source. And next week we'll have one full lecture on special theory of relativity, how gravitation affects the the wavelength of light. Because when light is emitted from massive bodies, their wavelength red shift also because of gravitation. So that's one important source. But we are pretty sure that this is mostly because of that. Because, because of the space time and because of the gravitation, the effect is small. It can't be that much. Okay, so let's come to the final thing, and then uh, uh, we'll see a little video on this. In 1920, Hubble, who started his career as a lawyer, but uh, when he was, I think, about 40 years old, he thought that it's not uh, a great career for him. He switched towards physics. And he has built a giant receiving antenna to, to study microwave background radiation. But in addition to that, he also began work in astronomy. And but his favorite pastime was just to focus on far, far away galaxies and stars. As far as he can, with whatever resolution he has, and what he was trying to do is trying to map the uh, velo their velocity of recession and approximate the distance of uh, different stars and galaxies. So it's a complicated business actually. How do we uh, measure the distances of star? It's, uh, just to give you a hint, it's called catapulting. You start with a known object. For example, let's say. You are on Earth, and Earth is going around Sun. So you start from a relatively near object, let's say Moon or Mars or something, and then you look at a star from here, and you look at a star from here, and with reference to this, the position changes like this. If your reference is this, and the from change in position, you can find the the distance of object. And what he did, he trained his telescope on distant stars and galaxies, and he found, he made a simple plot. Just distance on one side, and speeds of recession of galaxies on one side. That's it. Distance, speed. And he started putting points. He would look at a far of galaxy, and he would train his telescope on one of its stars, and measure its speed. So he did it for a lot of galaxies, and then people have added it. And he saw this astonishing thing, that there is a roughly straight line relationship between the velocity of a recession and the distance speed. And he made this simple law that more distant a star or galaxy is, the faster is it receding from us. And since we are no 
special in universe, right? Everything is equivalent. Sun has no special place in the universe, it's just one of uh, many trillions and trillions of stars. So it means everything must be receding from everything. That was his conclusion. And then in 1930s and 40s, the theory of expanding universe uh, came up. By the way, this constant is called Hubble constant. It's 20 kilometer per second per uh, million light year. So that was his initial guess. And that's what people thought, that uniform universe has been doing like this forever. So more recent work has suggested that universe hasn't been constantly expanding at this rate. But uh, initially, after the Big Bang, universe expanded a bit faster. Then it expanded a bit slowly. And then came another era of uh, uh, expansion, where it expanded more rapidly. And, but nowadays, its rate is roughly like this. This number is still being uh, worked out. It's not uh, uh, exactly accurate. Its value is uh, fluctuating with more and more uh, data coming in. So from this thing, you see that uh, Doppler effect has been extremely important in physics, because using this fact, uh, people have been able to measure the speeds of stars and, and galaxies far away. And uh, that also helped us uh, turn the distances of stars. Yes, please. So there are a lot of things that could happen. Okay? So, and that's why the astronomer's job is extremely hard. So it's a very complicated process of exactly determining the distance. They have to take into account all these factors. So, so all these numbers that we tell, they're always approximate. And uh, uh, there is uh, a huge amount of uncertainty. Not too much, but there is definitely more uncertainty than what we do on Earth. And it makes sense, right? <laughs> but we still have enough data and less uncertainty to say what we are saying is true. It's not that it's just a stuff made up. Because you might have some uncertainty here, this number may be here, and since uncertainty is random, they may change a little bit, but overall trend is same. Okay. So let me uh, see if I can uh, show you a little video. It's uh, the speed, which is 20 kilometer per second. This is the speed of recession. And this is million light year. This is the distance. So for each million light year, the galaxy of star is moving with the extra 20 kilometer per second. Observatory in Southern California. The observatory offered some of the most advanced technology of the time. 
Using George Ellery Hale's magnificent telescope, Hubble photographed the nebulae, faint clouds of light that were a mystery to astronomers. When Hubble examined his photographic plates, he discovered a Cepheid, a kind of star that varies in brightness over a period of time. Hubble studied the variation in brightness and used the data collected to calculate the distance to the star. By his calculations, this star and the galaxy it's a part of were much further away than anyone had ever imagined, and the universe was much larger than the Milky Way galaxy. What he found was that the distance to M31, the Andromeda galaxy, one of, turns out, our nearest neighbors, is about two million light years. So people have been talking about the scale of our galaxy, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000, maybe 100,000 light years. What this meant was that M31 and all those other galaxies were not part of our system. They were themselves big systems equal to the Milky Way. Scientists now know that there are billions of galaxies, and each galaxy has hundreds of billions of stars. Hubble's discovery of the stunning size of the universe and the massive number of star systems within it revolutionized our picture of the cosmos. That discovery alone would have made Hubble one of the great astronomers, but he continued to study distant galaxies and made an even greater discovery. For five years, he gathered data on the movements of galaxies, recording their path and direction by studying the wavelengths of light. Different wavelengths of light appear as different colors of light. If a galaxy is moving away, its wavelengths of light are lengthened. This light appears redder. The faster the galaxy is moving away, the redder the light. If the galaxy is moving closer, the light wavelengths are shortened, so the light appears bluer. After many years, Hubble could sit down and look at this great quantity of information, and he plotted a chart. He plotted for the nebulae the motions against the distances, and he found something truly amazing, a straight line. He found that the distance of a galaxy is proportional to its velocity. So as you go twice as far out, it turns out the velocity is twice as big. You go three times as far out, the velocity is three times as big. We live in a world, I mean, a big world, and a universe, where everything's rushing apart, and it's happening in a way we call Hubble's Law, where the velocity is proportional to the distance. This startling discovery means that the universe is expanding, and that concept forms the basis of the Big Bang Theory, which says that the universe began between 10 and 20 billion years ago from a state of enormous energy, density, and compression, and it has been expanding ever since. Three, two, one, and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Discovery with the Hubble Space Telescope. crew aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery deployed the famous telescope named after Edward Hubble. It orbits about 380 miles above Earth's surface. That high up, the Hubble can view the cosmos unobscured by Earth's atmosphere, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Technology has advanced since Edward Hubble's time, but the work remains the same. The telescope's job is to collect images of stars in distant galaxies. These images help astronomers measure the age and size of our expanding universe. Okay, so let's call it a day. So I'm here. This is a real life lore video made possible by Squarespace. Make your next move with a beautiful website from Squarespace. You want to see the next one? This I don't know what it is. You live here on this planet somewhere.